Welcome to the Building Performance Podcast from the Building Performance Workshop and the Proof is Possible Tour. I'm Corbett Lunsford, and today we're talking about trends and high-performance building and retrofits with Thomas Marston with Energy Services Group. You guys do verification and testing and all kinds of stuff, and you've been doing this since 1990. Is that right? That is right, Corbett. Awesome. I met Ed Minch in 81. I did an energy audit for him through the utility, and we just became... Uh, really good friends, and I soon realized after nine years I needed to change from utility to private sector, and I joined Ed in 1990, and we've had a great time for some 25 years. Awesome. And so thank you very much for talking with us today. Uh, first of all, you uh, just came from, when we were in Baltimore for the, the tour, your company also brought us out there. You uh, were absent that week, and it was because that you were involved in the next cycle of code adoptions for the Energy Conservation Code. Um, What was that experience like? Well, we were uh, considering amendments to the 2018 IECC, the International Energy Conservation Code, and weighing the alternatives of adding to the code or degrading the code, as people might feel. Degrading. Degrading. (laughs) We're taking back efficiency. And, Corbett, what we were really trying to do is integrate cost-effective into the code. It's really critical that we build for a realistic price of a home, that we don't overload it with costs that people can't then afford. We can certainly build Taj Mahals, Mm -hmm. but there's only one of those in the world. But we need housing for everyone. Mm -hmm. And for those who need simple, basic uh, housing, we need to make it cost-effective. So that's what I was there doing. And code being really, you know, the way that I describe it to the homeowners that we're talking to, code is a D minus grade. You want to have it be a minimum requirement, not some fantastic performance criteria, right? So it's like, meet the minimum requirement, and then if you want to do more, uh, and is there, so how does that work, by the way? Because if there's, if you go above and above beyond code, you could call it beyond code, or you could call it totally awesome, or whatever. But is there any kind of code language about like if you wanted to go further than what we are requiring you to do here in this book? Uh, the first chapter in the code speaks to above code programs. So Energy Star would be designated and it should be designated an above code program. The National Green Building Standard or LEED should be designated as above code program. And it's really difficult with how the code has developed in a very short period of time for the industry to understand the scale of performance for a home. Because if you've only looked at Imagine your horse with blinders. You only see directly in front of you. But if you can't see low-performing homes and high-performing homes, you have a real hard hard time understanding that scale. So at this point, the code industry has a hard time recognizing high performance. And we're hoping to put some of those measurement tools into the code so we have an ERI, we have a and that stands for, for energy not... rating index, and it's very similar to what is a HER score, home energy rating score. It's a numerical value. It now considers all of the aspects of the home, not just the energy leaving aspect of the home or heat loss. Mm-hmm. And by doing that, we can better understand the house as it relates to, as the homeowner relates to it. What's my energy bill? Because we pay an energy bill. We don't consider heat loss, Mm -hmm. and we want it to be what consumers will understand, and once they do, they will know that I want a home with a really low ERI, because lower is better, the same way as we understand that cars want a 50, 75, or 100 mile per gallon MPG rating, like the Prius and like the Tesla. Mm -hmm. I'm curious. So there's, it's my hypothesis that eventually the code, the what is now called the International Energy Conservation Code, will eventually be called the Performance Code. Because, of course, a car not only has the miles per gallon, but also has the safety rating of like how many airbags and the crash test and all that stuff, where a home might have the combustion safety and the moisture control and the air quality and all that kind of stuff. And it strikes me that as we shoot more towards energy saving, we sometimes 
are uh, doing it at the uh, harm of safety control and moisture management because obviously people will start doing all of the air tightening and the insulation stuff that we know we're supposed to do without hiring somebody like Energy Services Group to look over the shoulder and say, hey, by the way, you're creating some side effects here. We might want to spend a little bit of money over here on moisture control or on air quality. Um, is that a thing that you're seeing in the code uh, development that they're kind of thinking about the whole home as a system, air quality, moisture, all that stuff as well? Yes, moisture management was discussed in a number of amendments. Ventilation, which is in the 15 code now, was discussed in more detail. And parts were added in. Other parts of it were considered too extreme or above code and assigned to the voluntary programs. And a very good one would be the green building standard mm. uh, because it is a holistic process of building uh, starting all the way at the land use, uh, siting houses properly, getting density, uh, using the right materials, not waste wasting materials because of dimensional issues, uh, and water management inside the building. And the last thing in the green building standard is client education. Mm. If the homeowner doesn't know the ventilation strategy that is that bathroom fan exhausting all the time is necessary and they turn it off, they're going to harm themselves. Even though the builders tried to do everything right by the code mm -hmm. and high performance, the homeowner wasn't educated to understand why that's there. Mm -hmm. And that really does happen. Uh, they're, they are defeating systems that are installed specifically for their health. Sure. I think that that process starts as somebody moves in and they decide to install cable or fiber optic line or something, and somebody goes up the attic and starts drilling holes and things. Also, bath fans are quiet enough now that you can't tell whether they're on or off. Is that kind of those understandings of like how the manufacturers are building things? Are they involved in the process of getting the codes uh, evolving? Uh, the, yes. There were a number of manufacturers who actually came, and I'll use the term lobby, hmm. But they were advocating for aspects of the code to improve. They are definitely there at that event. There's actually, in the ANSI, stand, ANSI process, there's two discussions of the code. There is a uh, committee that evaluates and audience that presents pro and con. Hmm. They develop a set of criteria that will advance to the next general meeting of the code review uh, occurs in October, and it is the final action hearing of the code. Uh, and so the industry is closely involved with the development of our housing, hmm. both and commercial as well. I did, I'm not involved in the commercial side. I'm also not involved specifically in the building of home, the life health safety. I'm focused more on energy because I'm an energy raider. Mm -hmm. Now, when we were talking uh, just a few minutes ago about this before the interview, we were talking about the cost effectiveness. And specifically, you were saying that there are a bunch of things that we're requiring in the 2012 and 15 code that are kind of above and beyond. And it's because you, uh, your perspective is that we should go more towards performance of each and every home, not requiring every home to be a Ferrari or a Taj Mahal, as you just said. So what, what happens when we go from a prescriptive to a more performance-based approach? Well, we give builders the opportunity to choose based upon economics. We have learned in really small houses, slab on grade, two-story townhome, might be about 1,500 square feet of living space and somewhere around a uh, volume of 20,000 to 25,000 cubic feet becomes very hard to make that house reach three air changes. Why subject the builder and all the burden to reach that when I could choose to bring all my ducks inside, choose to install a high performance heating and cooling system, install solar electric. And if those are economically better choices, why force an additional $1,000 to get aggressive air sealing when I could assign that $1,000 someplace else or assign 500 of that someplace else and end up with a lower cost to operate and lower cost to build? 
So performance path gives back to the builder choices actually forces the arc, the builder to participate with design engineers, which are energy raters, modeling software, and find the best cost to build at the lowest operating cost for the homeowner. So we end up achieving what we're after mm. in this performance path. Prescriptive is really easy. Black and white, do A, B, C through the weather zone criteria. But a builder might say, I don't want to spend engineering time. I just want to do simple basic. Fine, that's your path. Mm -hmm. But I want to spend engineering time because I'm going to build this 100 times this year. Then the engineering time gets assigned into those 100 units, and he finds it's very economical to move from a 2 by 6 wall, as we have to do in Maryland, back to a 2 by 4 wall framing because I brought all my ducks inside because I put in high performance heating and cooling boxes or the hybrid water heater. So now economics lets him decide mm -hmm. best way to build. Now as a code minimum, I agree that uh, you don't have to be awesome. However, I will say to any builder or architecture build, uh, developer who's listening to this, hitting three air changes per hour in a small house, which the tiny lab, which we're speaking from definitely counts as, I have never built a house before, and I just want all of you to know that I hit 1.3 air changes per hour as a beginner. So uh, it is possible to hit three, but as a code minimum, I totally, I, I will grant you that it's hitting five is a pretty good uh, starting point. Uh, let me ask you about this, though, because one of the things that you mentioned is getting the energy rater into the conversation, which is critical. And I, I totally agree that I think having that feedback where we all have the conversation together and you don't just say, well, what do I have to do to hit here? Okay, great. Let's just do that forever and ever and never have a conversation about it again. The energy rater, though, and, and I think that from you as somebody who's really been around and you clearly know how to talk to builders and to have that conversation be fostered, a lot of them are having a hard time not just rating, which means critiquing and going in and saying, oh, you're doing that wrong. It could be more energy efficient. And really, how is your understanding of your job as being the informer of the of the energy design of a house also uh, coming into play in your mind with this cost effectiveness so that you can have a rational conversation with a builder that they actually won't run away from. How, how do you suggest energy raters who might be listening to this have that conversation and really don't come across as just an energy geek who's trying to get them to do everything possible that's about energy conservation? Corbett, some of my best builder examples are builders that I've worked with for half a dozen years. Uh, one comes to mind, building in Columbia. He used to build homes, three to 4,000 square feet, had two heating systems, two ductwork systems. Um, we spent four years moving him to one heating and cooling system, all ducts inside, because we didn't commit ourselves to get him to buy in on everything right now because I know it's the right thing. On the first house. We couldn't get that. Yeah. You have to learn because of your failures. You never learn because of the ones that work right. Hmm. You have to show people, well, that didn't work right. Now, kind of frustrating, let's discuss ACH 50 at 3. What if it doesn't work right? Do you get the privilege in the code to try again? Hmm. In theory, no. But we want to recognize that failure lets us advance our knowledge to get the next one right. And you're fortunate that you have a blower door. You know what building leakage is. You know where it's probably going to occur. And so you built a very airtight shell. Builders don't have your eyes, mm. and they're also focused on a dozen or a hundred other things. So as a raider, I've got to get their attention for one short period of time to get them thinking about airtight or cost-effective or more insulation. Sometimes I lose. Mm. I try to win a couple of events, get them as my really good friend, as a trusted ally, 
and then get them to bite a little bit more of the apple and a little bit more of the apple. And sooner we, as this builder in Columbia, he's building houses with hers 45 to 50, 4,000 square feet, one air handler, not typical. Many of his potential buyers come up and says, where's the other air conditioner box? Doesn't this need two? One of the things that you're interested in seeing happening is the performance path taking the requirements of duct leakage, for example, and blower door testing and making those part of the performance outlook. Is that right? That is so correct. that you can pass a house for code compliance with it not meeting five air changes per hour or three change, air changes per hour or the duct leakage requirement as long as you do other things. Is that right? Trade off. And with respect to building leakage or duct leakage or insulation, have a minimum that I can't go below. Because the, if my house is at 10 air changes, it's probably going to be uncomfortable again. We left that concept 20 years ago. So we understand we can build them more airtight. So there is a allowable not to go below but uh, an ability to understand where I am on the continuum of building tighter. Mm. And that builder who walks into the code for the first time, we know we're not going to get a vented crawl space with ducks in the attic as a 1,200 square foot ranch to be at three air changes. And if he comes to me before he does code submittal, I want to say, we're going to submit you at five. We're going to do everything we can to get you complying, but the next time you build this house, it's going to be a conditioned crawl space. The ducks are going to be in the crawl space. We'll easily get below five, and I'll show you how we can get closer to three. And maybe in the third house, we're at three air changes. We're not struggling over this, and all of a sudden you're demonstrating that you have a HER score or an ERI that's well below the code mandate. Well, I love your example of a builder who comes to you before construction begins as a first-timer, because you and I both know that. Wish they all did that. <laughs> they're they're going to come to you right before they have to do the blower order test and say, I, we, we were told that we need to pass code and blah, blah, blah. So what I think is fascinating about your idea of having the uh, air tightness and the duct tightness be optional if you go performance path is that you can, once they fail... Get involved in the process and help them to comply with code without them having to tear the house apart to tighten it up. Which in Illinois, when we adopted the 2012, we had plenty of people go for duct testing after all of the ducts were embedded in walls. And they failed. And of course, at that point, it's AeroSeal. That is your only option, which is a, a big hunk of money. And sometimes it doesn't work because the holes are too big. So I think that with your concept of coming performance after a failure... You could model the house, and now, the, as you said, the HERS Raider is involved in the conversation. The builder starts to understand trade-offs as a home-is-a-system type of a concept. And they could invest in some PV panels if they wanted to, or do some upgrades of some easy stuff instead of breaking into walls and having the whole thing feel really sour in their mouth. Um, is that kind of the, the essence of what you're going for? The concept is there, although the code officials will see that differently based upon the jurisdiction. Hmm. Code officials don't want to be tricked into the answer. They want to know the answer up front. And so a builder still has to understand the complexity of the energy code, a 12 code, 15 code, and future. And start to engineer the answers in. I think if they leave it up to the last day, put the paperwork together, here's how I got compliance, I think they're still going to run into a problem mm. because the code official will real will see it as my ability to administer the code is being subjected to engineering answers. Mm tricked mm. into compliance. I don't think they're not going to like that. Well, I've already been told in Maryland, this trade-off approach needs to be engineered in and submitted from the beginning at the beginning. Okay. So builders, if you're listening, learn about the code, find the experts who help you comply with the code. Don't come at it at the 11th hour. Mm. You will always struggle that way. Yeah. 
Well, in Maryland and also in Illinois, we adopted early on the 2012, and now you guys are even on the 2015 in Maryland. Okay. Uh, a, in a lot of places, and in Illinois even, when we adopted the 2012, we found that the code officials themselves were not trained or even given a code book in many cases. Mm. So they had all kinds of misinformation. I know that many people uh, that I met up with in a code capacity, they would come out to see a blower door test because they believed that the blower door was a visual test. Not understanding that I can make the manometer say whatever I want it to based on the numbers that I put in. Um, we're trained by somebody who was hired by the state who is not a code person. And you, you and I both know this person. But it's interesting that the code officials themselves locally have to have the training as well in order to tell the builders, hey, this is what you're going to have to comply with. Because a lot of times they're given the ultimatum right at the last minute before the certificate of occupancy is given to a builder. Hey, don't forget, you have to get their duct test. And they say, whoa, what? I don't understand that. So how, what was the conversation about that process like? Was there a conversation about that process? No, there wasn't. The idea that code officials have to become as knowledgeable as raiders is probably a big reach. I'm sorry. I don't mean to say that they should be as knowledgeable, but they should know that raiders exist, what they do specifically, and that ducts tightness and blow order testing are required when permits go in. I had a, a lot of people come through, and at the very end, the code guy would say, oh, and I can't give you your CO until. Well, Corbett, what I've asked code officials to do is understand the complexity of the architecture. And when they see a design starting to move away from easily complying, big house, to a small house, to ducks outside the building envelope, when they can easily be brought inside the building envelope, to raise a red flag with the builder developer and say, your architecture is complex enough that I encourage you to go find an expert. The code officials already do this. If there's a structural issue, they already raise a red flag and say, and say you need to get an engineer to stamp that. You need to get an architect to certify that. They need to have reasonable vision to understand energy performance and where the building's going to fail and not deny the builder the right to submit a permit, but recommend that they get better advice hmm. on what they're going to build. And best example, two-story house, vented crawl space, and ductwork only for the portion that is in a running from the air handler to the attic or down to the crawl space is inside the house. This house was built very close to me. It was 1,500 square feet. It didn't have to be built that way. Its energy bill could be reduced 30% by just by saying to the homeowner, builder, condition the crawl space, Here it's, here's how it's done. Put all the ducts that you're putting into the attic, put them through the floor joists that were 14-inch TJI. You just have to be cored and accept the ductwork to run through it. Very simple design. Oh, and by the way, you don't need an extra ton of capacity that this unit has. We would make the energy bill go down. We would build for less money. He didn't need to build with 2x6. He could have built with 2x4 wall framing. Less cost to build. And all we needed to do at some point in the application was to say, I think you need to get a second opinion and stop you for a week or two weeks in the process. Ouch. You'll get a better house mm -hmm. at the end. Now, does he want to do that? Maybe he doesn't. <laughs> but if he gets up to a blower door test and it's at four mm. and we got to take the house apart, should there be a process that says, did you understand the failure? Mm -hmm. If you did, talk to somebody who does not who gives you the ability to not repeat this mistake mm -hmm. because it's readily fixable in the next house. Mm -hmm. And I, code officials don't have as much of an opportunity to give a gray answer as they have to give black and white answers, mm -hmm. pass, fail. But Although I, I think, I mean, I've seen in uh, some Canadian television show about home... Uh, improvements and, and things like that, that the code officials in, in this one example were seen as 
uh, consultants, kind of like, let's, w- this is what we're planning. Is this okay? And they would say, oh, you know what? There's a better way to do this. Do you think that there's a chance as we go through these next couple of code adoption cycles that code officials will stop being yelled at by builders and feared and, you know, like, oh, this guy's going to come in and screw up my entire process and tell me that I need to rip all this apart and start being seen as that kind of uh, advisor to, to uh, enable you to know that your house is safe what you're building is, is right. Do you think, do you see that happening at all in the culture? It's going to take probably a dozen years, 10 years to get there because the new code officials will need to be trained on the knowledge that raiders have, the building science of homes and the energy code, especially in Maryland uh, in Vermont or Massachusetts, excuse me, are the most progressive. But the code officials didn't start in the early 90s with the energy code and progress up to see the iterations. Hmm. They got dropped in with the 2012 you must blower door test. What's a blower door? Mm -hmm. So will we get to code 2021 and have a better knowledge of this? I hope so. And because Performance Path seems to be picking up momentum, we will have to give gray answers and we'll have to give guidance. Life, health, and safety is a black and white. You can't do that because it's not safe. But with energy, it's just more energy used or less energy used. Where do I get to modify my design as I build this product that yes i would love to see that but it won't happen in the next code cycle and it's probably going to take 10 years awesome. for us to be at the level of the canadians and i am very jealous of what they do well thank you for helping us to get there <laughs> in this country as well tom thank you so much for talking with us today corbett i loved it thank you very much thomas marson is with energy services group on the east coast and is one of the thought leaders in this field you have been listening to the building performance podcast i'm corbett lunsford tune in next time